welcome to Embargo, a podcast featuring intelligent talk about sanctions, export controls, and all things international trade for trade nerds and normal human beings alike. I'm one of your hosts, Brian Fleming. I'm here, as always, with my friend, colleague, and co-host from a cozy, um, well-powered hotel room in Canada, Mr. Timothy O'Toole. What is going on, Tim? What is up, Brian? I'm keeping up my streak of not recording in the United States. So now it's, I think it's two in a row. Last time was Germany, I think. And this time I am in uh, Quebec, um, recovering from the derecho. There was a derecho, which is apparently kind of a wall of tornadoes that came through Saturday. It actually had a lot of destruction. We had a big derecho that came through DC like 10 years ago, essentially. And yeah, that's no joke. Um, yeah, we could we could pile on another recording next week so we could add another country since I know That's you're going to be on the road too. But um, I, I think I think we'll I think we'll uh, we'll stick with just this one for the uh, for the. I'm sure the there will being. be there will be more international recordings as we go forward. I'm sure there will be. Um, welcome to everybody. Thanks for joining us again on Embargoed. Um, thanks for everybody who we heard from after the last uh pod um that we put up a couple weeks ago and the with the emergency introduction that we had to record after um OFAC's um gifts to uh President Putin on May 8. Um we are actually I am happy to say not going to spend a ton of time talking about Russia today. We are actually going to go back to our other favorite topic, which is China. Um, there'll be some Russia that works its way in there, but we are largely going to talk about China today uh, and China-related topics. Um, I think this is going to be a brisk, we're not calling it an all lightning round episode, but it is going to be relatively um, brisk. We have four main topics. We have one lightning round topic, um, and uh, that's going to be all she wrote for today. So um, before I jump into the roadmap, the normal um, caveats before we get started, Uh, We're not sharing any confidential information. We're not providing legal advice. Any and all opinions and views that you hear on the pod are mine or Tim's. If you disagree or dislike, please blame us. If you like the pod, please subscribe. You can find us anywhere you get your content. Please spread the word. Uh, Embargo's here brand new every two weeks, more or less. Uh, This episode we're recording on May 26th, just before Memorial Day weekend here in the U.S., and it'll be up uh, probably at the very beginning of June next week. Um, and yeah, before I go through our topics for today, Mr. O'Toole, any any thoughts, any pearls of wisdom, anything else you want to share? It's good to get out of Russia. Um, I, I, you know, we've basically since February 24th, it's been Russia all the time, 24-7. Um, and I do think that that uh, the the pace of the sanctions has slowed down. It might be a temporary pause um, because I do think that with June 24th coming up relatively quickly, uh, we're going to find out what's going to go on in the energy sector of Ru- Russia fairly quickly. But for now, I think it's good to turn to other topics because it might be the, the calm before the, the, the second phase of the storm. Yeah, and, and obviously still a lot of fallout from all of the topics that we've been discussing um, incessantly both on the pod and among ourselves and with our clients but nevertheless i think we are somewhat relieved to be talking about anything other than russia for if if only for the next 45 to 60 minutes so um without further delay here's what we're going to cover today we're going to start with um the very eye-opening comments from president biden the other day vowing to defend taiwan in the event that china were to invade um, we are then going to pivot to another China topic, albeit related somewhat to Russia, in terms of some recent reporting on the d- decline in Chinese exports to Russia since the beginning of the invasion and the um, imposition of uh, new export controls and other trade restrictions by the U.S. and other allied countries. Uh, we're then going to talk about an interesting one that we haven't really touched on before, which is the idea of what some are calling a reverse CFIUS process or an outbound investment um, review process from the U.S. Uh, we'll, we'll hit that. And then final topic, main topic, is also, at least in, in some small part, China-related, which is um, a new advisory that was just issued jointly by Treasury State and DOJ about um, North Korean IT workers and essentially helping um, companies be on the lookout for red flags and to take compliance um, 
risk mitigation measures to um, to sort of find uh, lo to locate, identify, and and remediate that risk that appears to be growing uh, over time. And then finally, in the lightning round, one topic, which is another recent advisory, this one about Sudan and uh, Sudan business advisory that was just issued jointly by several agencies a um, few days ago. So we will, and that'll be our show. So. Um, anything else before we get started, or should we jump right in to Taiwan? Let's, let's jump in. Let's jump right in. Topic number one. Um, so as as I said, and and in the event um, anybody out there has just not been following the news the last few days, uh, President Biden was on his first trip to Asia since he has um, taken office, and was asked by a reporter at a press appearance um, what he would do if uh, what the U.S. would do in the event that uh, China were to invade Taiwan, a topic that is hot on uh, the minds of many, many persons around the world in, in light of what is going on with Russia and Ukraine at the moment. And he made a statement that essentially uh, could be interpreted to mean that the U.S. would intervene militarily if uh, China were to invade Taiwan, which obviously is a stark contrast to what the U.S. has chosen to do with respect to Ukraine and, and Russia. And so this obviously is, is um, I think the ultimate question here is, what does this mean or does this mean anything? I think that's kind of the big question, which I'll pose to you in a moment, Mr. O'Toole. But, you know, just to unpack this for a moment and to, to give some context to 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 the, the possible meaning and implications of this pronouncement, obviously there is a longstanding uh, U.S. policy of our favorite, probably our favorite term, strategic ambiguity with regard to uh, what the U.S. would and would not be willing to do with respect to Taiwan uh, and coming to its defense in the event that China were to invade. Um, so some, of course, immediately decried the fact that, oh my gosh, the U.S. has abandoned strategic ambiguity and now President Biden has committed us to um to uh, maybe a more clearer position on this issue. Of course, uh, his team and other senior officials from the U.S. government immediately <laughs> immediately walked back to the statement and said, no, we haven't changed our policy. Strategic ambiguity essentially still reigns, um, including the Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State. Many other senior officials have essentially um, kind of re reconfirmed the U.S.'s prior position. Not surprisingly, though, there was a lot of um, sort of teeth gnashing and anger coming from China side about how this is provocative and upsets the upsets the balance in the region. And, and and quite frankly, I think the you know, for those who, again, are not have not followed this as closely over time, the fear and the risk here is that the U.S. does something provocative that China will then take as an invitation to invade Taiwan because they say, well, we had no choice because the U.S. was, we had to go first because the U.S. was going to come for us. Um, and that is, of course, not what anybody wants and um, would, I think, really be a, um, just a, I can't even put into words how, how sort of cataclysmic that could be if that's what were to happen. So, um, not surprisingly, everybody has done a done their best to try to walk this back. I think related to this also is another topic that we've been talking about a lot, which is, um, you know, the idea that with the U.S. response to the invasion of Ukraine, what tools may be sharpening in the back room to be awaiting the Chinese if they were to try something similar with respect to Taiwan, whether it be sanctions or other types of international trade, national security related, um, you know, punitive measures, uh, controls, um, sanctions, et cetera, that might be deployed in the event that they were to um, go beyond just provocation and actually um, actually attempt to invade Taiwan and, and sort of, um, you know, take it over uh, and uh, erase what has been, um, you know, what the Ta the Taiwan Taiwanese regard as their own sovereign territory. China, of course, does not necessarily and has been slowly working to get as many other um, parties and countries aligned on their side there. But, um, you know, that is held that is held for decades and um, hopefully will hold for decades more. But 
Um, so let me let me open up to you. What do you what do you think here? Does this matter? What does this mean? Does it mean anything? What is the what is this foretell perhaps for? Um, does it erode or bolster U.S. ability to um, you know beat back China's advances with rhetoric and sanctions and other uh, softer non-military tactics? Or is this the beginning of backing China into a corner that it may that it may spring out of in a in a way that's really not going to be beneficial to anybody. Yeah, so obviously there are a lot of parallels to Ukraine. And I think the first one is that um this whole provocation notion and and a, and not wanting to be too provocative is kind of a it's kind of a false dilemma for lack of a better term in the sense that if you if a country wants to invade and it's looking for a provocation, it will find it no matter what you do. And I think Russia just proved that with Ukraine. I mean, they were really, I think, hoping that they, there would be some sort of flare up in the in the Donetsk and, and Luhansk regions. There really wasn't. So they made up this whole like we've got to go denazify Nazis, Ukraine yeah. type, type. There's Nazis. We've got to go in for the Nazis. I mean, so if you're looking for if you're looking for a reason to invade, you're going to invade, and and there's not really a lot that can be done about that. So avoiding provocation might be kind of overrated. But I think the second thing is that from strategic ambiguity to what President Biden said is just so far removed, it's not even funny, right? I mean, it wasn't like he was ambiguous at all. The question was, are you willing to get involved militarily to defend Taiwan if it comes to that? And the answer was yes. Yes. That's and then the committed. reporter that's followed up and yeah. said, really? And he <laughs> said, that's the commitment we made. So so like there's there's not any ambiguity there at all. I mean, the the when they when the president's advisors tried to to clear this up, they suggested that 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 you know that that was consistent with the Taiwan Relations Act and in a way it's consistent with the Taiwan Relations Act in the sense that we we do have a have some sort of obligation in that act to defend Taiwan if it is invaded on the other hand we are committed to the one china policy which essentially agrees that Taiwan is is part of china at least in the long run so i i, I don't know i i i I have a real tough time with why the president would have done this. I, I get it. I think that 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 there is this sense of helpless helplessness watching a country being invaded where they've been invaded unfairly and illegally and and they're clearly not the aggressor and you don't want to sit there and watch on TV as as you hope they win, which is what's going on in Ukraine, but still like what is really the the point in this if he's not trying to change the policy? I, I'm not I'm not totally clear on on why this happened, or other than just like we all feel bad watching what happened to Ukraine. So next time we're not going to sit by and watch. But the reason we're sitting by and watching in Ukraine is because Russia has nukes. Well, so does China, and so I don't get what the strategy is here. But um, yeah, maybe you do. No, I certainly do not. But the the um I I think the one interesting thing to think about here and maybe as a parallel to what we just lived through from 2017 to early 2021 is you know president trump was obviously very keen to to sort of fly off and make pronouncements about various things that were going to happen or were had to happen or this is the way things are the thing the way things will be and oftentimes what it seemed seemed to be the case is that those words ended up kind of getting weaponized against him in somewhat unforeseen ways sometimes whether it would be by by china or other uh foreign powers or whether it would be in the various lawsuits that we saw where there were you know the quotes and the comments were being used to show that that um agencies were not perhaps acting in good faith or were not um you know or were not adhering to or following the obligations that they had to uh discharge their duties in a non-arbitrary non-capricious sort of way um depending on what the um what the various uh you know action was that was at, at issue and i wonder if um you know this is this is a little bit of to me, this feels a little bit like that, right? It's just sort of these words may may linger and may come back to haunt either the president or some aspect of of his um, 
of of his the agencies under his uh, care at the moment but it, how exactly that's going to work i'm not quite sure but i think it is it is sort of policy making by pronouncement in some ways which of course is not exactly sometimes that is done in a very calculated way this clearly was not um you know i think interestingly one other one other kind of final thing that i'll throw out there is um secretary blinken gave a speech today at gw in dc wherein the whole focus was china and in he didn't he didn't address this issue really directly but in many ways he sort of did by talking and laying out in very careful terms and in very well vetted terms precisely what the u.s policy is with respect to china in terms of kind of regional containment and and other and other sort of similar concepts and identifying china as not surprisingly the u.s's longest sort of biggest long-term challenge and, and goal to try to um you know address and contain uh, despite what's going on in, in ukraine at the moment so i think that's probably more indicative of you know what the true state of u.s policy is with respect to china at the moment um than what president biden let sort of fly off the cuff the other day that being said obviously when things like this happen it can have dangerous and unintended consequences and i think there's been a lot of again a lot of analysis as to sort of how this could play out whether it will mean anything in the long term or not um i think it's sort of too soon to tell but um the more often things like this happen obviously the more we creep toward a, a reality where perhaps it will have some effect as opposed to it can just be brushed off as a as a, yeah you know an off-the-cuff remark i think he's speaking from the heart because i know that it's probably hard for him as it is for for many people around the world to sit there and watch what's happens in Ukraine and not get actively involved. And so, you know, it was almost like, a, well, if this happens again, we're not going to sit by on the sidelines. Right. The only way that, and I think that's probably in some sense, good politics. I mean, it was straight talk and it's very clear and it's kind of where I think most people's hearts are right now with respect to Ukraine. But, but, God help us if it actually ever comes back to haunt him, because it's basically going to come back to haunt him in a way where China actually does invade Taiwan. And either we do get involved militarily, which is hard to contemplate, or we don't get involved militarily, in which case those words yeah. are thrown back in his face. Either way is probably a loss, <laughs> a big yeah. loss on, on his head or whatever, how, whatever the case may be. So yeah, let's, let's leave that um, for now. I think that's just a, you know, again, we're not we're not necessarily here as a we're not a foreign policy podcast at the end of the day we're a trade and national security podcast but this is so big this this is sort of such a big item we felt like we had to kind of lean into it and lead with this and given that we're doing effectively well, an all china episode here it does kind of color a lot of the other things we're going to talk about and, and a lot of the other discussion with respect to china i think going forward well, and and now that you mentioned that, I mean, I guess to tie it back to sanctions, since this is a trade podcast, I mean, I, I think that one thing that one thing that the war in Ukraine ha has shown is the limits of sanctions, and I think people are expressing that viscerally when they're they're upset that the U.S. hasn't gotten involved either by you know creating a no-fly zone or more actively becoming involved in the Ukraine defense efforts, um, and and I think that that that's part of what led president biden to express that sentiment in connection with taiwan because obviously if china were to to invade taiwan one option would be to stand on the sidelines and and just sanction you know it, it impose sanctions at at, at 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 almost lightning speed as they've done with russia and that hasn't turned out to be very satisfying although i think you know we've talked on other podcasts and we'll talk again i'm sure in the future about how effective those sanctions have been and you know, I think there's there's mixed signals at this point, but in in general, I think they've been pretty effective for sanctions. Um, but sanctions have limits, and I think that that is in part what drove the president to to say what he said. Yeah, and and of course the the sort of related point there is the idea that as we've talked about, imposing a comprehensive not not an embargo, but a, a fairly comprehensive sanctions regime and export controls regime with respect to a country as large as Russia has effectively never been done before. Um, China obviously has an economy that is orders of magnitude larger than Russia. And so that also begs the question, if we're seeing limits even with a country like Russia, which clearly there are 
the sanctions and the export controls and all the other restrictions that are happening multilaterally are in fact I think taking a toll, but that certainly still hasn't brought the war to an end. So the question of, all right, if we're if we're doing this with an endpoint in mind or a deterrent effect in mind, and it's not working here, how do we how do we square that with what might happen or how we would game out what would happen or what the response would be with respect to China and Taiwan? And I think that is always lurking in the background with everything that's going on with Russia right now. And it's the perfect segue into our next segment where we're going to talk about Indeed. Chi- China's response um, in terms of the worldwide sanctions against Russia in light of Russia's yes. invasion so, of Ukraine. So take that away. I'll take that away. And and I think you know one thing that is, is really interesting or has been interesting as this conflict has unfolded has been China's response. China, on the one hand, has not condemned the war, has not uh, and and in fact, um, President Xi met with President Putin in China just before the war started. What was said there, I guess, is probably only will ever be known to them, maybe to the history books at some point. But uh, the strong suspicion is that there was some sort of accommodation reached in which China, China said, you know, if you go into Ukraine, we won't mind. And if you get sanctioned, we may help. And um that was certainly what the U.S. seemed to be thinking when, at the beginning of the war, uh, Secretary Blinken, I think maybe even the president, but I, I know Secretary Blinken, started saying to China, don't help Russia or yeah. we will, you know, our, the sanctions will target you We're as coming well. For you. Yeah. And, and in fact, so far, the numbers show that uh, China is really not helping Russia in terms of sanctions, and in fact, in many ways, is complying with the the very strict export controls that the U.S. has placed on on Russia exports, Russia re-exports, that would apply to China to the extent that they have items subject to the EAR that would be going to Russia. And so those those requirements would require the Chinese re-exporter to get a license um, for any goods that are not EAR 99, which for many tech goods are not EAR 99. And so you would expect, in light of the export controls, that if China were complying with those export controls, that a lot of the tech goods that China has previously been exporting to Russia would have decreased. And lo and behold, since many Chinese goods are subject to the EAR because they incorporate either U.S. technology or U.S. products, or they are U.S. products, um, Chinese shipments of laptops to Russia fell by 40% in March compared to February when the war started. Um, Exports of telecommunications network equipment fell by 98%. And so at least the early figures suggest that uh, the Chinese companies and the Chinese government are complying with U.S. export controls when it comes to to Russia. And even in a, in a, a recent article in, I think it was the, the Washington Post, um, there were quotes from representatives of Huawei talking about how they are taking the export controls seriously. And and I guess that makes sense in in uh, only to this extent, and then I'll, I'll throw it over to you. It, at least to me, it makes sense because both CTE and the Huawei experiences have really uh, driven home that when it comes to U.S. origin goods and technology, that the U.S. actually has some real power to cut off the supply of tech goods to China. And China really is very dependent upon U.S. tech goods and U.S. technology. And so even though it's not a perfect, you know, Huawei was still getting many goods during that period and still is and still is lawfully through licensing, the, the placing them on the entity list really hurt. And I think placing ZTE on the entity list when it was on there really hurt. And the penalties against ZTE really hurt. And so I think Chinese companies have the message that if they mess around with U.S. export controls, it, you know, it's not going to, they, they won't get caught every time, but they, they may get caught and they may get punished and it may actually really put a hole in their business model. And so as a result, it seems like Chinese businesses have decided that they'd rather, um, not help Russia than than help Russia, and that that's been very interesting to me because I I was I was skeptical of whether China would participate in in kind of the worldwide cutoff of Russia after the the war started. Yeah, I, I mean a couple of 
a couple of quick comments, and this will this is going to echo some things that we've said previously when we've kind of talked about this from a slightly different angle. I agree completely that the da the data you're describing certainly suggests that at least in the early weeks after the invasion and after the new export and re-export controls and the broader foreign direct product rule with respect to Russia and all of those new measures went into effect as well as all the multilateral allied country export controls um, there seems to have been a clear you know cause and effect uh, that and that China was sort of heeding those new rules um, and taking them seriously uh again this is a snapshot we don't really know this is sort of the first month post invasion is what is what's being sort of cited here that tim tim was reading those numbers and the the article from the post from about a week ago was was um was remarking on so we don't know how this is going to evolve over time um and whether there's going to be a continued um sort of adherence to the rules over uh, the duration of this, especially as the war continues to drag on. We don't really know at this point whether perhaps there was a thought that, oh, this is only going to take a few weeks or a month or whatever, and we can pause for a while, we'll, we'll, we'll shut everything down or we'll, we'll curtail, and then um, you know we can pick back up again in two months, three months. And now here we are at the end of you know three months later, and things are still dragging on and there's no end in sight. So that is always uh, important to remember. Um, and yeah, I just, you know, it's also possible, quite frankly, that, and I think there were some quotes to this effect in the article that, look, there are many, there are many global manufacturers of technology products that have just said, look, we're not shipping to Russia anymore, period. Even if perhaps it's, it's permissible under the regs. And we know, and we've discussed at length, that there are many, many, many reasons why that could be the case, whether it's, um, you know, fear of diversion, payments issues, reputational issues, all kinds of other things, obviously. So there are many, many factors that are going into this decision at big global multinational companies. And that also could, quite frankly, be driving a lot of this and not necessarily just a pure regulatory analysis of, yes, we must adhere to the new rules. It could be these broader factors and these players that uh, have interests that sweep, that touch China and have, you know, a line through China in terms of their supply chain um, and potential, um, you know, distribution into Russia. And there's all so there's all kinds of factors and all kinds of reasons why this could be happening um, at the moment. Again, I just it is it is interesting to note, um, though, I think, as Tim said, that perhaps some lessons learned. And, um, you know, at the end of the day, perhaps the judgment, the risk judgment made that by um, big, whether big Chinese companies or multinationals that, that um, are operating in China or have um, operations or supply uh, chain, um, you know, not nodules in China, that, that these things are, um, you know, being taken seriously, at least at least at this early stage. Yeah, I, I really think that the key to all of this was the EU. I I, I mean, I agree with you, Brian. It, it is too early to, to read too much into these figures. But I just get the sense from multiple data points that the Chinese are not helping the Russians evade sanctions, at least to the extent that we thought that they would. And I think a big factor in that is that the EU has come out um, with the toughest sanctions it's ever imposed. The UK the same way, and that the US, the EU, and the UK have all been on the same page. And I think that part of China's strategy, certainly during the Trump administration, and it was very effective during the Trump administration, in part because President Trump played right into it, was to divide the US and the EU. It was to essentially, you know, the US could be hostile, but China would move closer to the EU, in part because, in comparison, you know, the, it, nor, in normal times, the U.S. looks like a liberal democracy that is relatively sane. In normal times, China looks like an autocracy that is very efficient, but is certainly not the the logical ally of a of a group of liberal liberal democracies like the EU. For a for a period, 
the the U.S. and China looked flipped, similar. They in, flipped roles. Yeah, <laughs> they flipped roles, and and Europe was certainly, um, I think, uh, going down the path of kind of almost neutrality between the two, where it sometimes was friends with China and sometimes friends with the U.S. But it was gonna, but uh, China was very effectively playing us off against each other. Right now, I mean, there really doesn't appear to be any daylight between the two, and I think that probably scares China a lot. And so the idea of doing something that then kind of further alienates China from the EU and the U.S., and particularly when they're united, is something that is is I think something that China is unlikely to want to do, and I think that it really does have to do with the fact that the the allies on this, NATO allies and Japan and and South Korea and Australia, are also united on this issue. That China really doesn't want to get on the wrong side of that. Yeah, I agree. That's a really good point. I agree with that. One last thing that I'll add to another kind of X factor in all this, which again I think we've talked about previously. Obviously, there is a massive COVID related lockdown going on in China right now. There's yeah. a lot of economic strain. There's a lot of what from what is being reported by the by the Western media, uh, there is a lot of growing sort of frustration in China about the tactics that are being deployed by uh, the president and his um, and his regime to try to keep in check any further COVID outbreaks. And so, you know, that's just I I don't even know how that really cuts, honestly. That that probably says that at some point, perhaps, again, China may just act in its bald economic self-interest to the extent that it feels that it needs to because it's perhaps dug itself a little bit of a hole due to this little, you know, um, this little disruption because of the COVID lockdown. But uh, I don't know. I mean, that's just, it's just another thing to keep an eye on. It's another sort of unpredictable factor that we'll have to just watch to see how things play out here in the coming months. It will be, it will be fascinating. I'll be really interested to see when we have six months of data, you know, a year of data post, you know, imposition of the broader export controls on Russia uh, and to see sort of what that has done, not just, not just from the U S and the EU, which will, which will be pretty obvious and stark, I'm sure, but from, from countries like China and, and, and a few other places where, there was certainly a real question mark at the outset how this was going to be received and how it would play out. Yeah, it's a great point. I mean, and it does kind of uh, it, it drives home the the notion that you shouldn't be re- relying too much on small sample sizes. I mean, those numbers that I read at the beginning that that could be driven at least in part by the the COVID lockdowns in China. And I mean, that that could also explain part of the the reason for the drop of exports to Russia. They didn't really have any, I didn't see any articles in the, or any, any figures in the piece about um, whether, you know, how China's general exports uh, were affected during that time period, but it certainly could be at least in part related to the COVID lockdowns. I think it pre, I think it probably predates the worst of that though. I think it probably, I think it it does, but but it is a good point. So in any event, let us leave that for now. Let us move to another, at the end of the day, sort of China related topic, which is let's call it uh, reverse CFIUS or outbound CFIUS, um, which is in, in, um, you know, for anybody who follows this at all, this is something that's been kicking around for a while, this idea. This is something, quite frankly, that dates back to uh, when FIRMA was being drafted, that there was a potential idea in some of those early drafts of including a new authority, either for CFIUS or from, for some other um, sort of interagency body that would police and would review outbound from the U.S., uh, foreign investment, in particular, uh, foreign investment that would be going to places like China, countries of concern, and might involve or deplete um, U.S. Uh, sort of resources to um, to develop, produce, uh, et cetera, critical infrastructure, critical technologies, critical um, things that are critical to the national security of the United States. So this has been around for a while. This is something that was part of has been part of now other pieces of legislation more recently so last summer the united states innovation and competition act included something that would have um would have established this outbound review process let's call it or this uh reverse CFIUS. that did not get ultimately passed as part of that 
It was, however, par- passed by the House as part of the America Competes Act early this year. So this is back in late January. So this is just part of the reason that we haven't had time to get to this yet is that this all kind of has come to a head or or has perhaps gained some momentum just in the um, just in the lead up to the Ukraine invasion. Um, but in the America Competes Act, and I should I should caveat this by saying there's very important. There's by no means a it is by no means a certainty that there's going to be anything like this that gets adopted or enacted um there's a lot of disagreement not surprisingly across the government and across industry as to whether this is a good idea or not um i think there is general bipartisan support it seems in congress for something like this especially something that could be tailored mostly um at china i guess now it, look, it seems that Russia would also probably be a priority. There would probably be a few other. It seems that it is styled as it would be tailored to um, review transactions uh, or investment that would relate to countries of concern, which is a term that we've seen before in the CFIUS context. But um, it, it is, I think, something that if perhaps properly scoped could could get a bunch of people on board. What it has been... Um, what has been styled as is the Committee on National Critical Capabilities. That's what it would be, essentially, as the um, American Competes Act has has envisioned it. That's what it would be called. It would be another interagency body. It would be chaired by USTR, not by Treasury. Um, interestingly, USTR has publicly <laughs> been pretty lukewarm about the idea that it would be the chair, including in some congressional hearings on the topic. Um, the Commerce Department, by contrast, and the Secretary of Commerce, Commerce uh, Secretary Raimundo, by contrast, has been pretty enthusiastic about this idea. Treasury also has, has been pretty bullish about this. Um, so perhaps in the, in the final in the final analysis, it, maybe it would be more likely that it will not be USTR that chairs this, but it could be another agency. There's also been talk of perhaps estab- establishing something like this purely by executive order. Um, Jake Sullivan, the National Security Advisor, has talked about this. Other senior administration officials have talked about this. Um, I'm not going to really get into the weeds too much in terms of what this would actually cover. Um, again, in the, in the America um, Competes Act, it is envisioned as a mandatory process. Um, it is it is envisioned as um, applying to U.S. businesses that would um, be engaged in certain types of outbound investment. Um, again, that would relate to national critical capabilities, which not surprisingly is something that would have to be further defined. Um, that would relate to systems and assets so vital to the U.S., that inability to develop such systems and assets or incapacity or destruction of such systems and assets would have a debilitating impact on national security or crisis crisis preparedness. There's a few kind of areas that are flagged as um, likely to be included there, including medical supplies, medicines, and PPE, um, articles essential to the operation of manufacturer supply service, maintenance of critical infrastructure, um, articles critical to infrastructure construction after a natural or man-made disaster. A few others are also some other areas that are would be put forth as areas of further study, including energy, communications, defense, transportation, aerospace, robotics, AI. Many of the same, many of the same areas that FIRMA has focused on, that the Export Control Reform Act has focused on. These are not big surprises, and again. There's no guarantee that any of these in their current iteration are going to ever make it through if there ever is an outbound um, investment review mechanism that is put in place. So why are we talking about it? Well, it does seem to be, again, gaining a little bit of momentum. There is further discussion about how this might be um, dealt with, if there's going to be any sort of reconciliation that happens between the America Competes Act and the sort of Senate companion to that bill that was passed last year. And so I think there's a legitimate chance that this summer this is going to be something that is a further topic of discussion, certainly in Washington and in um, national security and industry circles. So with all of that, let me pause and let me throw it to you, Mr. O'Toole. What are your sort of thoughts on reverse CFIUS outbound investment review or something similar? Good idea, bad idea. Could it work if it's sort of properly scoped and resourced and defined? Is it just a 
doomed to fail. There's no chance it's ever going to get passed. If it did get passed, it's just going to be a debacle. What are your thoughts at this point? All of the above. Um, <laughs> so thank you, thank so, you, M- mic drop. We're out. Exactly. <laughs> Shortest podcast ever. Perfect. Um, so, I mean, I, I'm not deep enough in the weeds to to have strong feelings about this, but I, I will say my my sense is that it's potentially a um, you know a a protectionist measure that is dressed up in um, in in national security concerns and and what i what i mean by that is it's not like there aren't already export controls that would cover all of these things and prevent the export of technology to these places without some sort of review by the commerce department the the state department the defense department there's so so all to the extent we're talking about us products us technology us you know exports of critical infrastructure there there already is a mechanism for that there's also a mechanism that if foreign you know adversaries want to come in and try and buy that in the united states and take it home cifius already exists i i guess there is a little window where essentially you invest a u.s persons invest so much in other countries that they dry up u.s access to these sorts of technologies but they do it without exporting u.s technologies u.s u.s know-how u.s um you know u.s goods but it seems very small i mean it seems like to me that this is essentially a way to go after china and and russia by filling a gap that is very narrow and has not been seem to be a recognizable problem but i don't know enough about it to say that for sure that's just my sense yeah my my so my sense is that um a couple things one is again because this is this isn't in some ways an old line of thinking and discussion that has been around for a while that i recall being kicked around when firma was being drafted um this is i think seen as a gap right it's seen as a gap in the so-called government toolkit to be able to protect u.s national security interests in terms of outbound investment and um despite the fact that there has been a broadening of u.s export controls and there is in likely in all likelihood going to be more coming when we eventually get sort of um the foundational and emerging technologies regs um and that is all of course targeted to china and this is primarily targeted to china uh, as the main country of concern on everybody's mind at the moment, there is, I think, the genuine belief in policymaking circles that there is a gap and that this would help close that gap. Now, I have seen some numbers that suggest that, uh, for example, you know, this is, I think it would all be about, to me, it would all be about how this is defined because, as contemplated, at least in the American Competes Act, it would be a mandatory regime. So it would not be, if you're covered, if you have a covered right. transaction, it's mandatory. So, so broader than CFIUS in that sense. Correct. So CFIUS obviously is only in part mandatory, still mostly voluntary. This would be mandatory, at least as conceived of today. Um, and that uh, any, and it would cover a lot of different industries. It would cover a lot of different scenarios where there would be outbound foreign investment by U.S. companies, U.S. businesses. And... Uh, by some measures, there w- it would cover. It would have covered if this, if such a rule or such a regime were in place now, or or for the past ten years, it would cover something like fifty percent of all outbound investments to China, let's say from the U.S. So that would be a massive, massive undertaking. And obviously, there has been a lot of efforts, whether it be through the sanctions, whether it be through export controls, whether it be through, um, you know. Uh, the non-SDN measures that have been put on Chinese military industrial complex companies by OFAC, et cetera, to sort of curtail U.S. investment in China and to decouple especially supply chains from U.S.-based supply chains or U.S. company supply chains and U.S. uh, know-how and IP from the Chinese market and so this would be obviously kind of taking this i don't want to say to the logical conclusion necessarily but it would be sort of further extending that and again in the eyes of some filling a gap now 
everybody who has looked at this and, and, and folks who are active in the CFIUS bar and folks who are active in the national security bar are the primary people who are kind of focused on this at the moment, not surprisingly. Um, they are quick to bring up the faults and the problems and the flaws and the likely at lines of attack that are going to come in from industry because quite frankly we've seen this all before we've sort of seen this play before whether it was with respect to firma or other attempts to try to get something like this off the ground so that being said of course again the president could act unilaterally he could just issue an executive order that would essentially stand up a regime or would order ustr the commerce department the treasury department and other agencies to engage in an interagency effort to to basically create such a, a regime and six months from now or a year from now, voila, we would have something. So it could always go that route if this were deemed to be sufficiently important to do that. Um, that being said, I think because there have been a number of legislative proposals, that's probably the preferred way to let this play out. You know, we'll see. We'll see what happens here over the next few months. We'll see if any of the sort of government back proposals gain traction. We'll see if something along the lines of America competes, um, you know, can can hold its own as this goes forward. Or we'll see if the whole thing ends up getting scrubbed and, and we're sort of back to square one. Even if people acknowledge that this may be a gap, it's maybe a bridge too far at the moment. But, you know, we'll see. We'll see. And if ever there were a time when this could come together, maybe now is the time maybe it now is the time with respect to russia and ukraine in the lurking in the background what we just talked about with china the sort of precarious state that we're in there who knows it could it could it could be um we'll see we'll see how sort of factors um converge or diverge to make this happen or not happen but um yeah it's just one that we wanted to flag because it obviously if this were to move forward this would be a pretty big deal this would um i think immediately um overnight really become sort of a big problem for many many different companies across the united states and so it's certainly one to just keep an eye on well i mean just to to throw one final wrench into this i mean i i again i'm not as familiar with the the specifics of the legislation so so maybe this isn't a problem but it does worry me a lot that uh, a, if a U.S. company wanted to set up a subsidiary in one of these country, countries, which many U.S. companies do and have, as we've seen from Russia, I mean, many are getting out now, but there are U.S. subsidiary companies all over the world, and for good reasons. I mean, the U.S. can go in and compete with other countries in their own economy um, and, and in a way that is on the ground in that country as opposed to just coming in as a foreigner. This, this would seem to affect that. Right. I mean, it's investment in other countries. I would think setting up a subsidiary would be one of the, the most common forms of investment in other com countries. And so I, I, I really do worry that this will undermine the you know, U.S. business and the ability to have to, to compete um, in a way that's probably unintended. But it, it, it seems to me like a logical consequence of, of this sort of law. Yeah, I mean, again, this is sort of the reshoring or onshoring of U.S. resources and supply right. chains, right? It's sort of the, it, it's one of the last uh, plays in that playbook to some degree, and you know, agree the devil's going to be in the details in terms of what what would or would not pass muster here, um, and you know, what would be covered. I mean, what would be covered in the first instance, I think, would be is is a fascinating question and, and obviously going to be a huge fight if this does move forward the, even with that then what would be kind of permissible as a, as a matter of the the new committee's risk tolerance is a whole nother question obviously um so yeah i think again um many unintended consequences and perhaps detrimental consequences that could come i think to u.s ec economic interests and perhaps even national security interests if something like this were put into place but that being said, again, I, I, I can attest to the fact that there are plenty of folks out there that are still in government or perhaps former government that do honestly believe this is a gap in our current toolkit and as a result might warrant some further consideration as to whether this could be done in a sensible, strategic way. So we shall see. So with that, let's move to our final full topic of the day, which is the DPRK.
and I'll throw it to you, Mr. The O'Toole. DPRK. So we've talked about North Korea quite a bit on this podcast. And, and on May 16th, 2022, the U.S. government issued an advisory about IT workers from North Korea um, essentially fanning out throughout the world uh, and and not advertising themselves as being from North Korea, but that they are coming from the North Korean government, according to the to the the fact sheet on the advisory. The government, the U.S. government, has said that the, that North Korea has dispatched thousands of highly skilled IT workers around the world, earning revenue for the DPRK that contributes to its weapons programs and in violation of U.S. and UN UN sanctions. And that's that's the premise of the advisory. And then it goes on to describe the types of industries that have been in, infiltrated and kind of tries to give a, a profile of how these North Korean IT workers operate. Um, and it does seem to be, you know, relatively widespread. I mean, I, I, I it, they do say thousands. They, I didn't see a lot of fact and figure, facts and figures in there about, about different organizations or where they're operating other than kind of just a general sense that it's Russia, China, and, and maybe the Middle East, um, some countries in the Middle East. But I, it, it then went on to give various red flags that companies could use to, to spot as to when they were, were potentially um, in the midst of one of these DPRK IT cells. Um, and I, I found the entire advisory a bit odd. I mean, I, I, it's a serious problem and it was a multi-governmental advisory but i mean some of the red flags struck me as a little bit like i mean i i i could see that like at the office certainly during the shutdown you you would see things like this happening in terms of the red flags i think one of the red flags that they had in there was failure to complete tasks in a timely manner or to respond to tasks and i I would say that some of my clients during the russian sanctions crisis would look at that and think that potentially i was a dprk (laughs) it (laughs) IT worker (laughs) worker. um you know incorrect or changing contact information specifically phone numbers and emails i mean like if you go through my contacts i'd say half of them are you know out of date um not my personal contacts but if i were to look at other people's contacts that i've had i'd be suspecting them of being dprk it workers this is the one that i think is has come up um is is more widespread than just with dprk K I T workers the inability to conduct business during required business hours um if everybody who is not working from nine to five during the pandemic um but is working other hours uh, is a DPRK IT worker. Uh, this is a really, really broad group of <laughs> IT workers. It spans the entire, um, the the entire uh, universe of people that I am working with at this point. Because uh, I, I think that this is more common than in that industry. And I, so, so some of the red flags were more specific than that. But some of them, I like. I, I don't know what to do with that sort of information because if that's a sign of what's going on here, then everything is a sign of what's going on here. So, yeah, I mean, right. I and mean, I'll look, pass I it think, on to you on that. Yeah, I think. It, look, I think it boils down to what we always say with these advisories, just in terms of deciphering what's really important here and what's sort of surplusage in in this you know qu- quite lengthy advisory that was issued so i would say that i would i would sort of say the following there's, there's a clear message that is being conveyed here to um those who rely on freelance it workers obviously um and who access freelance work platforms that perhaps um have the ability to provide you with staffing needs that are going to be slightly more anonymous and disconnected than what you would ordinarily uh, hope to see, whether it would be even even in a remote environment, right? I think that's kind of what they're getting at is that there's a level of, there's a, there's a tip, there's a tip in here, which is like, you should insist on interviewing the person in, in person so that you right. can verify their identity and things like that, which that's fairly sensible. But at the end of the day, you know, again, do the pandemic or otherwise, plenty of Plenty of times it's like, well, this is supposed to be a Zoom. Now it's a phone call. You know, we never really see each other face to face. You can see how these things kind of snowball if, if you sort of get lulled into thinking, oh, this is fine. So that's one thing. Another is um, the payments platforms, because if digital payment services are going to be used to 
um, pay this pay these folks and and it's sort of a client that's ultimately funneling money through the digital payment services especially any that have any connection to China which is flagged in here um, you know that's another potential vector um, for exploitation I would say by this cohort of uh, North Korean IT workers and so you know and then obviously the at the end of the day it's it's any companies who are using these freelance IT workers and may have you know some degree of anonymity or outsourcing that is happening to to a degree that perhaps in a perfect world would not be happening and there would be maybe more vetting more understanding about who these people are what their whether their documentation is legit background checks uh verification of certain you know employment history and other and other things like that and they and they go to great lengths to, in the advisory to talk about um the steps that are being taken to obfuscate and to sort of um misdirect to um, put companies off the scent here with respect to these um, these workers, no matter where they're sitting. And then, of course, the final logical extension of all of this is the idea that at the end of the day, um, you know, there's there's quite a bit of sanctions exposure for parties that are unwittingly dealing with anybody connected to North Korea. And so uh, that's spelled out uh, sort of at the end as a friendly reminder that if you're not taking this seriously and if you do in particular fall into sort of the profile of the type of company that might be implicated by the very detailed schematic diagram that they provide then and you are sort of asleep at the wheel and not taking appropriate precautions uh, and compl compliance sanctions compliance mitigation steps and you yourself could run afoul and could be uh, could find yourself in hot water. So I do think that the red flag list and the mitigation measures list is worth looking at, especially again, if you are somebody that falls into the category of um, one of the sort of the freelance pr platform providers, the payment services, or a company that avails itself of the these types of services through um, uh, a freelance, uh, you know, platform provider. So I, I do think that for that reason, it's worth it's worth a read. It is quite lengthy, as Tim said. Some of the things are quite are quite sort of I don't want to call them goofy, but are, are sort of uh, you could you can you can call them goofy. You could extrapolate to many other contexts that don't necessarily <laughs> single si signal that there's North Korean involvement. But nevertheless, if you like if you sleeps remember, late doesn't want to go to school <laughs> it sounds like um every teenager in america um so uh so yeah so anyway uh that did just come out a few days ago so we thought we would flag that one as well and i think that kind of nicely wraps up from a slightly different anger angle our our essentially exclusive or again a return to form essentially an exclusive china episode of the pod which we haven't done in quite some time yeah. um one quick, one, one two, two quick things. One is, I, I mean, I, I've, I've made light of it, but I, I do think if you're in those industries, it's just another thing to look for in terms of your sanctions risk, because now, you know, if you're in the IT industry and hiring these sorts of freelance IT workers, you should be on the lookout for this. On the other hand, don't go too far. I, I really do hope that um, this does not mean that in the IT industry that everybody who sees a, a resume from someone who has some sort of Asian background is now suspect for being a, a North Korean IT worker. From um, a freelancer. You know. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I agreed. I think let's, uh, uh, you, you know, let's employ reason here and right. in a true risk-based approach, not a... Um, and, uh, and and look yeah. at some of the the real red flags that were there, and there were a lot of them. I, I just yeah. flagged the ones there's, that were. There's a lot of goofy, technical. There's a lot yeah. Of there's a lot of technical. Ones. There's a lot of technical red flags, and in, including sort of you know suspicious VPN access and usage and other things like that. Those yeah, those and, things and requesting always... to be paid in crypto. Or, uh, you <laughs> right. know, let's right. let's think like yeah. you, regardless of this advisory, if you have an employee who's asking to be paid in crypto, you ought to figure out whether there's a good reason for it, and there might be, but that is not. Something Something that you can just say oh and, sure what's your account i mean it's, and, it's and hopefully right and hopefully anybody who has a, a properly functioning sanctions compliance program is going to be flagging those things anyway regardless yeah. of this particular advisory but nevertheless if certainly if you are um if your business is implicated on that schematic diagram then i would certainly advise you to take a look and uh integrate as necessary any of those elements into your own program and your own sort of vetting process going forward um so with that let's let's um take a pause for the lightning round sound effect and then we will go on to our sole lightning round topic of the day 
which is Sudan. Um, I have to say, I was a little surprised to see this um, this uh, advisory come out about risks and considerations for U.S. businesses operating in Sudan. Um, it was a joint advisory that came out from State, Treasury, Commerce, and Labor um, just a few days ago, earlier this week, actually. And the thrust of it, and of course, for the, the background here is, and we've touched on this a few times um, over the course of the pod, that Sudan used to be um, subject to comprehensive sanctions that has now gone away. Um, of course, there still are a number of sanctioned parties in Sudan. Um, and, and now what this is really calling attention to is SOEs and military controlled companies um, in the wake of uh, what happened in October of last year when the military um, essentially seized power again. Um, and, you know, I, I don't I don't have a ton to say about this other than, um, you know, I would certainly, and again, I, I can't say that um, at the moment, you know, Sudan still comes up a lot, I would say, um, in part because, Again, companies are still trying to sort of understand how to deal with it in light of the fact that it's not under a comprehensive embargo any longer. And to the extent that there's any uh, desire or ability to get back into the market, there's there's always those discussions that come up. And that's that's typically where I've had that discussion over time. I will confess I have not had a discussion about dealing with SOEs or military controlled companies or perhaps trying to figure out if, if there is an SOE or military controlled company on the other end of a particular transaction, at least not lately. Um, you know, there is still an arms embargo with respect to Sudan. There is still a lot of, as we said, san- sanctioned parties um, that are in, um, in the mix in the country. So there is still a higher risk level generally there. And I think as a, as a general matter, that is how most companies that I advise deal with it and treat it. Um, and so I don't know that there is anything in here that sort of jumped out at me as being all that earth shattering um, to sort of change that risk calculus, unless of course you are somebody that is dealing with SOEs and military controlled companies, then uh, to the extent that you weren't already fully apprised of or aware of the potential risk that goes along with that, I think this obviously underscores that to a uh, much sharper degree but beyond that, you know, I don't, I don't have a ton to say. I will just say, as a final thought, obviously when these, when these advisories are issued, that often signals that more is coming, whether in terms of designations or enforcement or other actions. So, you know, keep an eye out because that this could be, um, this could be the uh, signal that there is more coming with respect to Sudan and the program, and um, either more designations or um, other actions that could be coming from OFAC or state or otherwise. Yeah, I mean, that last point is the one that I really wanted to emphasize, which is that, you know, the advisory itself is interesting and it points out some risks in Sudan. It was kind of like the the last segment where we talked about the advisory talking about North Korea. What it does is it's interesting. And if you're in the right industry or you're doing business in those areas, it's really important. But what it's more important for is a signal, both as to enforcement priorities, because clearly when you have this interagency group that is making these advisories, it's something that the government enforcers are looking at at this point. And they're kind of telling you, we've been looking at this and we have some important information that we want to tell you about this. That also means there's probably investigations underway into those areas, potentially designations coming and potentially, you know, Sudan becomes more of a sanctioned country than it has been in the past. And so, I mean, my one thing, my one big takeaway is in terms of my sanctions practice is that um, uh, I won't be as rosy about Sudan as I have been in the last year or two, which has been, you know, you get clients, I'm sure you get clients coming to you all the time, as I do, where they're like, Sudan, we can't do anything. And it's like, no, no, that that changed a few years ago. So the rules have changed. And now, and now I think it'll be the rules have changed, but there's some indication that they may be coming back. Yeah. And the advisory actually goes out of its way to make that clear and to be clear that there is this is not sort of the beginning of the end of the era of a non-embargoed Sudan. Um, This is, you know, the U S government fully supports, you know, business with civilian owned companies in Sudan and, you know, NGO work there to help with humanitarian issues, et cetera. That is all kind of spelled out very clearly in the advisory. So certainly don't take it 
as more than it is. But, um, but yeah, I agree completely with, with what Tim said. So, um, so with that, that's sort of a one, one non China topic to end, uh, with in the lightning round. Uh, and that will be a wrap for today. So as I said before, we are coming up on Memorial day weekend here in the U S uh, this will be up early in June. Uh, we will likely be back sort of middle of the month. Um, uh, with our next episode. So, um, you know, who knows, who knows where we will be at that time. I suspect we'll be turning back, pivoting back to Russia with, uh, at that point, but, uh, but, but who knows at that point. So, um, with that, I will, I will wish you a happy Memorial day up in the great white North, Mr. O'Toole. Um, although I know you're traveling, so you won't even be, <laughs> you won't even be there for Memorial Day. I'm right? traveling on Memorial Day. That is on Memorial Day to coming to, back through the United States and on my way yeah. to somewhere else. To to parts parts unknown that shall remain confidential. Um, and uh, yeah, so for everybody out there, thanks for joining as always. And until next time, uh, stay safe and stay sanctions free. Stay sanctions free, everybody. Bye. Bye. This podcast was produced by HeartCast Media.